believe the Lord, church, is moving his people. That's you and I, amen? I believe the Lord is moving us into a new season of, of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I heard it here this morning. I heard it here right now. I heard the hunger in your hearts. I don't know what, what song we were singing, but we were like midway through, and I could just hear the people of God just speaking in tongues, man. I could just hear the people of God just lifting up that heavenly language to the Lord. And, and, and you know, it, it's not about the songs. Amen? It's not about the songs. It's about the author and the finisher of our faith. It's about Jesus. And so when you're worshiping, you know, it, it's not, I, don't, I don't care if there's a song playing or not. Your heart is full of thankfulness and gratitude to the Lord. Amen? And so when I heard you guys praying in the spirit this morning, I said, yes, Jesus, we're on point this morning. We're on point because I believe the Lord wants to pour out his spirit in a greater measure. And this morning we're going to be taking communion. And so the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians 11 and 27, I don't believe I gave this verse to the guys, but 1 Corinthians 11 and 27 says this. It says, so then whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. And so this morning, I want to talk to us about a, a heart examination, if you will. About looking inward, looking into, in, in, inside of our hearts and seeing that if there's something that would offend the Lord, if there's something that is a hindrance right now to your life and your spirit in this moment, I pray that we would deal with it today. Amen? Too many times I've seen believers and I've seen people that they, they hold on to things. We hold on to grudges, we hold on to offense, we hold on to the person that said something about you, and, it, and it's like a layers of weight that just pile on top of your life. And the more you're holding on to stuff, the more you're hanging on to things, the next thing you know, you're just dragging along. And there's no longer life in your spirit, there's no longer, you know, the abundant life that Jesus promised you, because you're weighed down by some sin, you're weighed down by something that you're not supposed to be carrying, amen. Amen. And so I believe there's times in Scripture, church, that before God releases an outpouring of his Holy Spirit, of his mercy, and of his promises, there would always first be a repentant people. There would be a people that would acknowledge the sin, they would acknowledge the things, the issues, in their life, and they would bring it before God. Oftentimes, I believe it's, it's a changing, or it's because of a changing of the hearts of God's people, that is what repentance is. It's a shifting of direction. It's knowing that you were once headed away from God and now you have made a 180 and you're turning back towards the Lord. I believe that when we move back towards the ways of God and the Lord would bless them by sending an outpouring of his spirit. Perfect, thank you. Why don't you bless the Lord for my brother? The Bible says, he who refreshes others, himself will be refreshed. That's cold. Praise God. The Bible says that the Lord would bless the people who have turned back to him with his spirit, with his presence. You remember the famous verse, 2 Corinthians, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people would humble themselves and pray. And turn from their wicked ways. He said, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. And I will what? I will heal their land. You see, there's that act of humility that's actually admitting that there's something in our life. Actually admitting that maybe we have offended the heart of God. Admitting that we have done something that cut or pierced the heart of God. And we say, Lord, I want to please you. That thing cannot remain in my heart. That thing can no longer remain in my life. It cannot have control over me because, Lord, I desire to give it all to you. I desire to please you, God. And so throughout Scripture, there's echoes of the Lord calling his people back to a place of repentance. Again, having that 180-degree turn or shift from their thinking, from their ways of life, from their mindset, and reestablishing him as Lord, as the center of which their world turns. There was a preacher that said this. He says, don't incorporate God. He said, surrender to him. 
And I'm so glad we sang that song this morning because that's exactly what it said. It was just surrender yourself to God. Do whatever you want to, Lord. And when we pray that prayer and we sing that song and we believe that to our core, it will always bring about to the surface the things that we may have hiding in our heart that are in need of change. When you say, do what you want to do in me, Lord, have your way in me, Lord, the Lord will say, I'll have my way in you, and this is the way. I'm going to expose something in your life that needs to be dealt with. Because the reason I need to expose that thing is so it can be cut off. Dead branches don't produce fruit. And the Lord is saying, the Bible says that he wants us to keep good fruit in, in accordance to repentance. And so there could be a dead branch in your life that the Lord is highlighting. He's saying, listen, you got to cut that thing off. It is unproductive. How many of you have ever tried to water a dead plant? It doesn't work. It's got dead all around it. You want to know how you're going to revive that plant? You prune it. I've had some dead plants in my yard before, unfortunately. Remember the freeze last year? How many of you had dead plants in your yard? How many of you actually had some grow back? Anybody? My neighbor, Eli, had a, like, I don't know, 10 plants or whatever it was. And every single one of them completely shriveled up to the bone. All the leaves fell off. All the stuff fell down. And he cut them down, and, and they stayed there. Over a period of time and the shifting of the seasons from the winter time into the spring, all of a sudden we started seeing buds of life grow back on them. Now those things are like huge and they're beautiful and they're gorgeous and they have all this vibrancy and all this color. When you allow the Lord to snip something off of your life, when you allow the Lord to cut off of that, that dead branch that is no longer a producing fruit, life comes back into your body. Life comes back into your soul. All of a sudden now you are able to produce the fruit that the Lord wants you to produce. And so this means that we don't incorporate God, but we simply surrender to him. It means we go back to the place of complete surrender to God and his ways. That word repent is defined like this. It means to do again. That word re means to do again. The word pent is like a penthouse. It's the top floor of a building, which means to go back to a higher perspective. So when you're repenting, you're simply saying, Lord, I thought I was doing something right. I thought my path was correct, God. I thought, you know, I was in line with you, God. But because you have identified something in my life that needs to be taken care of, now, God, I am able to see. Now, God, I'm able to bring my mind and my life back to that high perspective and see your ways are better than my ways. Your thoughts are better than my thoughts, Lord. In Greek, that word repent is defined as repent. It's a compound word formed from the word meta, which means amid or with, and noeo, which means to exercise the mind. And so the word literally means accompanied by an exercise of the mind with new understanding. Remember that prophecy in the book of Isaiah where he said, see, I'm about to do a new thing. But he said, you cannot perceive it. You see, in order for the Lord to do a new thing in your life, you have to remove the old way of thinking. You have to deal with that thing that you thought was right and say, Lord, I'm moving into that which you have for me today. And so I believe before an outpour, there must be a reposturing of our heart fully back to the Lord. Amen. Right now at the end of this, uh, or at the end of this time of worship, you said you just wanted Jesus. You said, I just want Jesus. And if that's truly your heart's desire, then you will open up your heart to come fully back to the Lord. Joel chapter 2, if you have your Bible, you can turn there. Joel chapter 2 and verse 13 is such a powerful verse. It says, rend your heart and not your garments. It says, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. He is slow to anger, abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. In the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse uh, 13, I'm going to read a little different version than you might see on the screen, but it says he added, now you should go and study the meaning of this verse. I want you to show mercy and not just offer me sacrifice. 
He says, for I've come to invite the outcast of society and sinners and not those who think they're already on the right path. I have not come to call the righteous, but I have come to call sinners to repentance. You see, mercy comes after a mourning for your sin. If you can truly see the thing in your life that the Lord is, is not pleased by, then mercy will come. And repentance, church, acknowledges our wrong and it turns towards renewal in the Lord. Amen? But religion would say, sacrifice this. Do this thing so that you can get these results. Act this certain way. Go to that certain service and offer God something and show others your remorse. And God is saying, listen, that way no longer works. He's saying, show me your heart. Show me your heart. Show me that thing that is in your life that needs to be addressed. We're quick to think, church, that our attendance is repentance. <laughs> We're quick sometimes to think that just being here is enough. Will I go to church? I go to church every day in my life. I've said it before, so does the devil. He goes to church too. Church and attendance is not repentance. We think at times that God is pleased with our helping of others. That is our good service. Our charity, our generosity. And yes, the Lord is pleased when we do something in a selfless way towards another. The Bible says that we should love others above ourselves. But even if you love others all the time, even if you sacrificially give, even if you help others and you're doing all these things, these things still do not change your heart. They might actually make you feel better. But there's not an amount of good deeds that we could ever do to please the heart of God. You see, a lot of times people do things thinking that that is somehow going to right them in God's eyes. But yet they still hold on to offense and hatred towards others. We think that our offerings and service and busyness before God will somehow earn us favor with the Lord. And the fact that the Lord has been unendingly merciful towards us. How many of you have received of God's mercy? I know I have. He's been unendingly merciful towards us. Amen. The fact that God knows, you know, he's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He sees, hears, and knows all things about you. The fact that God is omniscient and omnipresent, he could expose us all should be reason enough for us to thank him for his mercy. Amen. And we undoubtedly do not deserve that mercy, but I'm so thankful that God is gracious. Amen? But the Bible says that one day the Lord will return. And there are people now in this age that we are living in that are even mocking that return, even saying he said he was going to come then, and other people prophesied they said that he was going to come at this date or at that time. The Bible says that nobody knows the day or the hour. Not even the Son of Man nor the angels. But the truth is, is the Lord will return and he will not delay. 2 Peter 3, 9, that, that, that famous verse that we all read, it says the Lord is not slow as some understand slowness. But he's going to come. And guess what? He is coming for those who have repented of their ways. In the book of Romans, it asks an incredibly important question in Romans 12 and, and verse 1. Romans 12 and 1, it says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. He goes on to say this. He said, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, his perfect and pleasing will. The Lord is looking for you and I, church. And without unpacking this whole verse in, in a lot of detail, I believe he's simply calling us back to repentance. It's as simple as that. That is to stop wrestling with him and start fully surrendering our life to him. 
To stop the hindrances and move towards holiness. Amen. To stop trending with culture and start pleasing the kingdom of God. Amen. These are the things that the Lord is asking of us to allow inward heartfelt transformation by the Holy Spirit to reform our thoughts to his. To transform us in the likeness of Christ. Before the prophet Joel uh, prophesied of an outpour, he spoke of the things that the Lord would do as a result of repentance. And he spoke about new grain. He spoke about new wine. He spoke about new oil being in abundance, enough to satisfy the hearts of his people fully. And I want us to understand what this is, church. Grain would speak of the financial or material blessings. It was provision from God. That wine would speak of the joy of life and the joy of the Holy Spirit. And the oil would speak of the anointing of God, the empowerment of the Lord. You see, if you're walking without joy, you're powerless. If you're walking without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you're powerless. If you're walking in this world without the provision of God, you're powerless. And the Lord said to, to his people, and he says to us today, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it is by the Spirit of the Lord. In order to see Christ face to face on that day when he splits the eastern sky. In order to behold his glory and his goodness, church. It's not by might. It's not by strength. But it's by the spirit of the Lord. It's by the spirit of God. Romans, uh, I'm sorry, Psalms chapter 104 verse 15 says, A wine and wine that makes glad the heart of man. Oil to make his face shine and bread which strengthens the man's heart. Repentance, church, leads to the reopening of heaven over your life. Repentance leads to the reopening of heaven over your life to abundantly bless every area of your life, materially, emotionally, spiritually. Everything we need to be fully satisfied in this life is found in God. Amen. But I know that we've all gone through that season or that, that period of time in our life where we had felt as if heaven was closed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've gone through those seasons where you were praying and you were, you were calling upon God and you were, you know, just, just praying and it almost seemed like, you know, you were on a, on a treadmill. How many of you know that, you know, you can get tired on a treadmill but you're actually going nowhere? I call it treadmill faith. When you don't deal with your sin, you're in treadmill faith. You're getting tired, you're getting worn out, you're sweating. Shirts all stuck to you and everything, and you post a picture on Instagram for everybody to see that you sweat. <laughs> but you're going nowhere. There's no progression, there's no leading of the Holy Spirit from glory to glory. Because you're just merely getting tired and you're wearing yourself out because you're carrying things in your heart and in your life that God is saying, get rid of. In order for the Lord to bless your life, in order for heaven to feel open and to be open over your life, we must repent of our sins. And a life unrepented lives under a closed heaven. When Christ was baptized in the Jordan, it's important to understand this message. The message that was being preached at that time to that culture and to that community, it was a message from John the Baptist, and he was saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare ye for the coming of the Lord. Make the path straight and produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And so this baptism, this baptism that John offered, it was one of repentance. It was cleansing from sins of our old and dead life, and it was being raised back to life and renewed in Christ. But he said, there is one, this is John the Baptist, he said, there is one who is coming who will soon baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so Jesus being obedient to John's uh, uh, message, it wasn't that Jesus himself needed repentance, that's not what I'm saying. But Jesus setting the example, setting the stage for you and I, Jesus said it was honored to be baptized by John. It was a symbolic act to show everyone watching what a surrendered life to the Lord would actually look like. And after Christ was raised out of those baptismal waters, the Bible says that the heavens opened and that a dove landed upon his shoulder. And a voice from heaven declared, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. In whom I am well pleased. 
And so I declare in Jesus' name that the renewal the Lord desires isn't new programs, it isn't new ministries, it isn't new stage design or songs, but it is repented hearts resulting in open heavens. It's repented hearts in resulting in the spirit falling. Men, women, and children of all creation will be known as the children of God. This is what the Lord is looking for, church. This is what God is desiring because the empowerment and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is about to fall on sons and daughters. Can somebody say amen this morning? The movement of the Holy Spirit is about to change absolutely everything and the release from the Spirit from the heavens is going to cause a prophetic outpour. This happens, church, when there is repentance. When there is a shifting of the old ways and a turn uh, that is a bent towards heaven and a bent towards the ancient path of the Lord, it always precedes restoration. Anytime God is about to do something, he brings us to that point. He brings us to that crossroad. He brings us to that, that fork in the road that says we have to make this decision. It doesn't matter what culture is following. It doesn't matter what society is doing. That we would be that Joshua that said, as for me and my house, I'm not worried about the, the, the other guy's house. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. But whenever there's re true repentance, church, it always precedes restoration. It precedes redemption. It precedes renewal. It precedes revival. And it precedes the resurrection power of the Lord. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. Let's keep going. And afterwards... That is the repentance part. And afterwards, he said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Everybody say all people. On all people, he said, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and the billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Verse 32, and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance. As the Lord has said, even amongst the survivors whom the Lord calls. We thank you, Jesus. You see, somebody in this house needs to claim your son and daughter that they're going to prophesy. For every parent in this room, I know that we all have concerns about the future of our children in this country. We all have concerns about the future of our, uh, the upbringing of our children in this land. And sometimes we get far too dependent on the church to raise our children in the Lord when we have the power to raise our children right in the Lord. Because God forbid if one day the church door is closed, would your family go to heaven? God forbid if this place no longer existed, would you know the Lord and would you be able to teach the Lord? Share the Lord to your children. Share the Lord and his power and his goodness to, to the next generation. You see, and so we need to declare, we need to understand, church, that we have to proclaim these things and speak them to, to existence that your son and daughter will prophesy. That your young men will see visions. Ladies, nudge your husbands right now. That your old men will dream dreams. Because the Spirit of the Lord wants to do something. Why all of this? Because what the Lord desires to bring isn't going to be a movement of man-made blessings. I'll say that one more time. The Lord, the, what he desires to bring is not going to be a movement of man-made blessings or manufactured experiences in the church any longer, but rather a full display of the gifts of his spirit. A full display of his gifts of the Holy Spirit so that all men will know that it's not by might, it's not by power, but it was by the spirit of God. I was teaching on Wednesday in Acts chapter 4 and and I'll skip back to that verse just for a second. But I love what this says. It was talking about the apostles Peter and John. And they were, 
They were brought before the Sanhedrin people and they were brought uh, before the, their courts and they were being you know, accused of preaching the gospel and, and they had given them orders. They said, we don't want you to speak in the name of Jesus any longer. We no longer want you to go about teaching in the name of Jesus. And so as the scripture says, it said they called them in again and they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, it says, but Peter and John replied, what is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to listen to him? What is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to listen to him? He said, as for us, we cannot help but speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. And I love this verse in verse 15. The reason that they had ordered them to stop preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus was because a man got healed. There was a man that was standing in front of this council of people and it says since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them there was nothing they could say. When the kingdom of heaven releases the glory of God amongst the people, there is nothing they can say. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell and he began to move amongst all of those people, the Bible says that some people heard them speaking in their own language. Some people heard them and they said, are they drunk? What are they doing? What is, what is happening to these people? And it was literally the movement of the Holy Spirit that was the real tangible evidence of that had been released upon their life. And guess what? There was nothing they could say. In that day, there was hundreds and, and thousands that gave their heart to Jesus and they were baptized unto the Lord. Church, we need God. Amen? We need the Holy Spirit. Amen? We need everything that the Lord wants to do in our life. Amen? Even if that means that we have to deal with the things that we have inside of our heart and inside of our life, then we must deal with it. We've got to deal with those things. We're living in a time, church, where churches have tried to create feel-good environments. In the words of Mario Murillo, a, a favorite preacher of mine, he came to preach here many years ago. He says it like this. He says, LED screens, skinny jeans, and smoke machines. Nobody wants to see me in a pair of skinny jeans. I'm just going to say that right now. Look like a spider monkey. The problem with this kind of so-called church, and I said so-called church, because it's not real. It's make-believe, it's fake, it's false. It's, it's the farthest thing from the Holy Spirit that you could get. I said it. The problem with this kind of so-called church is that no one is leaving transformed. The problem with this kind of church is nobody is leaving healed. The problem with this kind of church is nobody is leaving delivered or saved. Husbands and wives are still cheating on each other. Families are still breaking apart. Addictions and bondage still hold the attendees captive. And it would seem as though God was non-existent. Do you know why? Psalm verse 24 and 3 says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Verse 4, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from, from God their Savior. Verse 6 says, such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Verse 7, lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Verse 8, who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he? Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. This can only happen when our hearts are blood washed and sanctified by the power of the blood of Jesus. This can only happen when we've repented of our sins and the things that we have done that pain and shame the heart of God and when we acknowledge the thoughts that we had are not pleasing to him. Matthew 9 and verse 4 says, knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil in your hearts? Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? I said at the beginning of, the, of this message, he sees your thoughts. He knows your, your mind. He sees what's taking residence in your heart. And if he is truly Lord, then there's only space enough inside of your heart for him. 
I said, if he's truly Lord, then there's only space enough for him, church. Everything else, all the baggage, the bondage, the unforgiveness, the idolatry, the malice, the anger, and the bitterness must be dealt with. It must be brought to the foot of the cross. Instead, we must live like the psalmist when he said this in Psalm 139. He said, search me, God. Search me, God, and know my heart. He said, test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When was the last time that we said, search me, God? In that day when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they hid from God because of their shame. They hid from God because of the shame from the things that they did that they knew cut the heart of God. And here we need to be so bold before the Lord, church, where we're not afraid to say, God, search me. Search me, God, and if you find something, Lord, I leave it before you. If you find something wrong in my life, God, if you find something wrong in my character, in my demeanor, if you find something wrong, how I treat my family, Lord, how I treat others, God, deal with me, Lord. Because, God, I want to know your ways, everlasting, God. I want to know your presence, Lord. I want to know your heart. When this happens and the believers are focused on pleasing the Lord, I believe, church, that we can experience again what happened in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And the Bible says that suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. See, one of the primary reasons for the Holy Spirit's release of tongues of fire is because I believe it's representative of this great, great weapon that we possess. He has called us, church, that out of this mouth, we would declare his goodness. Out of this, out from this tongue, we would declare his righteousness, his holiness. Not we would complain about our neighbor. Not we would curse those who've afflicted us. Not that we would just simply say whatever we want, but we would actually declare the goodness of God. It's through declaration, church, that captives are set free and the world will see the power of God. It's through our praise as a weapon of warfare that the body of Christ will demolish strongholds once again. It's through words of hope and comfort and peace that the church will reach others for the kingdom of God. And it's from our witness that we'll speak of God's unending power and grace and love for all mankind. The Bible says it filled the house. Tongues of fire filled the house where they were sitting.